Howdy, and welcome to Early Reflections, the podcast where young folks talk about making it in the sonic arts. I'm your host, Adam Daniel Jones, and my guest today, all the way from uh, Canterbury, England, is my friend, Georgia Parker. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Good. I'm hanging in there. Um, Real quick, before we uh, get started with anything, what are some pronouns that I can use um, to refer to you as? Yeah, uh, she, her is great. Perfect. Great. Yeah. And then, you know, before we we had talked about this before recording, but um, so before we get into anything huge, it is a wild time, at least for me as an American. And I can only imagine what it must be like as an outsider looking in on what's happening in the country right now. For reference, um, we're recording this on January 7th of 2021, the day after um, Trump supporters have stormed the U.S. Capitol um, on, you know, what was supposed to be a very rudimentary um, confirmation of electoral votes that have already happened. So I just I'm, I'm curious as to, you know, I don't take a ton of political stances on this show. I, I think I might have taken one early on, like right after the election when we started. But I'm just curious, especially from your perspective as a as a as a British person, like what must it be like watching all this unfold and like what? Yeah, just what's going through your mind? I mean, um, it's obviously, and when I saw it yesterday, and um, like at first starting, it's it's pretty awful, <laughs> and it's pretty unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the thing I was talked about is the fact that they even got in there in the first place. Yeah. Um, and you know, when you look at the difference between that and um, all the protests that were happening over the summer, yep. to do with BLM and all of that, you can't you can't not look at the two and see that there's a huge difference. <laughs> exactly. In the way that it was responded to, um, mm -hmm. it's even. I mean. <laughs> My, uh, our prime minister put, like tweeted about it and he's a shitty guy too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but even he said something and I was like, it must be really bad then. You know? <laughs> when, yeah. When Boris Johnson and when <laughs> Mitch McConnell, who in my opinion has totally paved the way for that kind of rhetoric to be spread in this country and to be so alive and well, um, you know, takes the moral high ground on it. That's when yeah. you really, you know, realize how. What is what a situation that is. So no, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I like to. I like you know that the the sort of what I've been seeing on um, the media here. I tend to watch more, you know, obviously left leaning news because I'm uh, more aligned with that, you know, state of state of mind, state of thinking. But um, mm. what I think has been really interesting that's been said is the fact that you can be shocked that it's happening, but in no way am I or a lot of people surprised that this is happening. You know, no, it, it it just is something that is really looking at, you know, history and looking at the amount of things that have just been enabled by, you know, conservative media, by the president himself, obviously, and by yeah. senators and Congress people. It's not at all surprising. It's still, you know, I, and again, I, I, I feel like people of our generation have we we seem to be kind of jaded with a lot of this stuff we we tend to you know and i know me personally i don't tend to get that wildly surprised about a lot of stuff but you you know i still am shocked when i see this stuff happening so no absolutely i mean it's like i can't remember when this was but when uh trump was speaking directly to the proud boys or whatever the yeah. i think that's their name mm -hmm. it's that <sighs> I mean, it's not surprising this happened. Like, yeah. He's basically speaking to white supremacists slash terrorists, whatever you want to call them, because they're all of the above, pretty much. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, all I all I all, you know, we'll we'll kind of move on to the to the rest of the podcast and try to, you know, serve as a, as a bit of a distraction from the craziness. But all I all I would say at this point is to all lawmakers, I doubt they're listening, but if they are, um, <laughs> it better be. you know, think about what side of history you want to be on. Think about the conscience that you would have if you continued to let this president sit and be a, you know, governor of this, of this country and what, and the amount of blood that you have on your hands. You guys, I'm, you know, I'll talk to Ted Cruz. I'll talk to, um, Josh Hawley. Those guys, you people, do not deserve a seat in government like Absolutely. straight up that's yeah that's me yeah yep i think you're pretty much correct on that <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay well so moving on um <laughs> i hate to do such a quick pivot but it really is so nice to see you um it's been yeah, a while you. i you know i've been done with college for 
about a year now. You know, I we're coming up on a year of yeah. I I moved back home right after uh, the winter semester ended, and it kind of sucks because I didn't really get to say goodbye. You, I would consider you a, a good friend, and I didn't really yeah. get to say goodbye to you or a lot of our other friends. You know, before yeah. I figured that. I was at least going to get a chance to come back and, you know, kind of say hi and, you know, check in. But then obviously the coronavirus um, pandemic started happening and lockdown started happening. So um, it's yeah. just great to see your face. Yeah. And you No, I know I was definitely I think I remember us having a conversation before the COVID thing about, you know, coming back for graduation and all mm -hmm. of that. Um pretty sad that didn't happen but it is what it is <laughs> yeah exactly well you know um as as bleak of a of a you know week as it's been there's there's still a lot of hope i have for you know yeah. things getting better and with the state of you know the vaccine and everything if if the rollout gets better hopefully it will at least in the states um it'll mm. it'll you know the the possibility of us being able to <laughs> reunite somewhat and you know have one have another hand <laughs> is looking yeah. better so. Yes, absolutely. It will happen. Yeah, I have hope. Uh, totally. <laughs> um, so I'll get into business. So for our audience, uh, Georgia, you are a singer, a songwriter, a guitarist, a producer, an engineer. Um, what else did I miss in describing you as like a creative person? Um, I think that probably does. That probably does it. Yeah. Cool. You know, and and again, like I've talked about this a bunch of other times on the podcast, but. You know, I feel like it's 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 such a good thing to have that tool belt of um, you know, sort of your hands in a lot of different pots type of thing mm. with with being an artist these days. Like you really do have to be able to advocate for yourself in whatever like field it is, you know, whether it's you know, engineering, obviously. We'll talk about your um your education with with engineering and production and mm. stuff. And and you it must just be nice to have like that creative uh control i guess over over your own output it must just be so nice to have no totally um yeah one of the best decisions i think i made was trying to actually learn about that side of things because it's taught me a lot about the kind of what i was already doing originally as well which is you know the writing of a song blah 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 yeah but yeah so talk to me a tiny bit about your like musical upbringing, what, you know, how much of a uh, part music was in your childhood and sort of your adolescence and then what kind of drove you to considering music as a career path? Yeah, I mean, I think I like very, very early on, I, I loved um, music and I mean, the first thing was singing. I, I loved singing and that was kind of the thing that I, I guess I, that was my hobby. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, I don't know, I guess as I grew up, I tried other things and I mean, it was all in the arts. Like, I was always going to be someone... I don't think I could see myself in <laughs> any kind of other career. I right. <laughs> just doesn't... Anyway. But, like, just... It was never a question for me in terms of that I wanted to do music. And then I, at some point, decided that, you know, I wanted to be able to play for myself when I sang. Um, and so I started playing the guitar at, like, 13. Mm. I think... Um, and just did that and then just kept continued doing that and so grateful I did that because I started the piano as well and I gave that up so mm, <laughs> um, yeah I'm glad I kept one of them um <laughs> and yeah I don't know and then I just it was it's weird because when I think about like um my musical upbringing I guess a lot of it was just like me writing for fun or even it was really like when I think about it now it was my therapy <laughs> yeah <laughs> to be honest like um but other than that, I mean, my um, my dad's music taste had a big impact probably mm. on me. Um, I mean, we always had music playing in the, in the house, like my mom and my dad and all of that. So yeah. that that probably had the biggest impact on me because I didn't live in like a, I didn't live in London. You know what I mean? I wasn't right. surrounded by like a city. I lived in Stelling Menace. Like, yeah. <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Kind right. Of, yeah. So um yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who were those? Uh, just out of curiosity, who were like, who are your dad's faves? You know, I have, I know I have a lot of, uh, I have to give my parents a lot of credit for introducing me to the music that I still have like such fond memories over. So what were, what was heavy rotation for them? Yeah. Um, Rodriguez was definitely a big one because mm. my, my parents both, um, they met in Cape Town and that was where he was, you know, in South Africa. That's why he was like, basically, um, like Bob Dylan. To, oh yeah. Yeah. And so definitely him and still a big fan and like Neil Young, like Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Even Bruce Springsteen yeah. played all the time in my house. Um, 
and a few things like that like and then that kind of went off into other realms for me as I went into like I got really into Jeff Buckley and um stuff like that but um yeah. those were probably the big names yeah definitely yeah man Rodriguez that's so that's so interesting because you know obviously in in the states he it's so like I'll tie back to the searching for sugar man documentary which I'm sure oh, you've seen so good I loved it yeah yeah he just has such an incredible story like you know he was big in the 70s released a lot of like a couple really really incredible albums but then just you know disappeared there were the rumors of him you know dying on stage or whatever <laughs> like which is hilarious and then you know seeing him just peacefully be living in I think Detroit um and just yeah. you know <laughs> living a, a very quiet life until he you know it was it was a uh, you know brought to his attention that he was still wildly popular in South Africa and then going there and you know, seeing that footage is so incredible. So, but yeah, I, I love the fact mm. that he was one of the people that is like really integral in your life because, you know, I, I personally didn't, I think my dad might've slightly known about him because he was, you know, our age, I think when that music was coming out. Um, mm. But I at least had no idea about that story. So I think that that's so cool. Like seeing that on your end. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think you know, because obviously when I was listening to him, I didn't realize the, kind of the history behind it. And then I watched the documentary and stuff. Um, <laughs> just such a cool, chill guy. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually went and saw him play when I came to Boston, because just by chance I saw that he was coming. I can't remember which um, like theater it was. It was mm. one of the, like, the smaller performance grounds. And I mean, when he was quite old, he's quite old now. Yeah. But it was so cool to like see him play. And I waited for him after and I kind of met him for a minute or two. Um, so that was, it was a nice little moment. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. He, yeah. I would love to, I would love to hang with him. He seems like such a cool, such a cool dude. Like, you know, he seems like, obviously he's so shaped by his experiences and he, he seems like somebody that would just be so wise and like, you know, very, very soft spoken. I feel like, I don't know if you can, yeah. if you can attest no, he, to that, but no, he definitely for the <laughs> minute and a half that I was in his presence. Yeah. He was definitely very, very chill guy. Yeah. He, it was, yeah, it was awesome. Um, so sort of back to you. Um, so talk to me a little bit about um, the music scene of where you grew up. Um, mm. Was it did you find it difficult to sort of, you know, be a young person in a scene like that? Did you find that it was relatively, you know, difficult to find gigs or like collaborators mm. to to bounce ideas off of? Or was it like relatively easy? You know, just talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, I think in comparison to um, like a lot of people that came to Berkeley, I really didn't l live in a place where it was like, there was a lot of musicians around. You know right. what I mean? There were like, and at my school, to be fair, um, it wasn't a, like it wasn't a music school, but there were good musicians at my school. And a lot of whom are like, you know, trying to do that as their career. Mm -hmm. Um, but I definitely, I had a, like, a few people that I had, like, little side projects with while I was at school and stuff like that, but, um, the gigging scene, <laughs> there wasn't one, <laughs> or yeah. at least I didn't at that time, I wasn't chasing that as much as because it wasn't, it wasn't in front of me, if that makes sense. Yeah. I was probably a little bit anxious as well. <laughs> oh, totally. Anxious teen. But, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, I had... I definitely, when I was like 13, I think I started a, like a two, a duo band with a friend and I can't remember what we called it, but it was a bit cringy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I, oh yeah, I had um, like later on a few years after that, I um, played with this girl who, and we called our band, I think we only did we one song and that we mm. recorded everything or she did it. She was very talented and we mm. called our band The Mother Focus. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> that's yeah. incredible it the was mother great focus. i know oh when i look God. back at that i really didn't you know i should have given that more than i did <laughs> i feel like it's such a it's such a thing of like when you're you know i i distinctly have memories of you know being being uh probably 11 or 12 or 12 or 13 and like having my first like small musical projects and i'm pretty sure I, I was in a band a little bit later. I think I was like 14 or 15. I was in a band that was called Not Jesus so Ooh. that we could like say that we were not Jesus. And we thought That's... that was really cool. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hate it. You know what? I think Good. that's actually, that's pretty nice. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. And the, it's just so funny, like, like listening to, or like, I feel like that's, yeah, I, th I think that I might've strayed from the point that I was trying to make, but I feel like it's such a part of like being young and like having a band is like 
the amount of energy and like what you want to get out of the name, like regardless of how terrible it is, you know? Yeah. No, the this, time. Is, this is absolutely true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So moving on a little bit, um, would you mind telling our listeners the like sort of impetus for our meeting, like where we ended up crossing paths because in the, in the grand scheme of things, um, we met pretty recently. Yeah. I think we met probably, we definitely, we met at Jules and Mitch's apartment, right? I think so. Yeah. 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 I'm pretty sure that we're about like, like probably like September, 2019. Yeah. Yeah. I think so like early, early fall semester last year. Um, and I think, yeah, I met you at their apartment and we used to hang out as a group quite a lot mm-hmm. with Jimena and that was yeah. a fun time. <laughs> yeah. I, I miss that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, I actually am pretty sure that I, I, I think that that's when we first like started to hang out, but I think that when you first sort of came on my radar, I believe you were singing. I think Jamina had Jamina Brashua, you know, good friend mm. of the podcast we've interviewed before. Um, mm. She had a recital and you stepped in and sang backups with her or oh, sang a couple yes. songs. Yes. No, I remember that. Was that? Yes. Okay. No, I remember this now. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I vaguely think I remember not to, not to, you know, throw you out there for illegal activity, <laughs> but I do not think you were 21 at the time. But we yeah. all ended up going to some bar and they just didn't check your ID. Oh, and I was sh- no. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I totally remember this now. Yeah, no, this was the bar. This was the only bar I went to. It was yeah. The only place. I think it's because I went there once and they looked at my ID and thought, oh, she's 20. And so they thought they knew me. And I was oh, like, yeah. Yes, I'm 23. Hello. <laughs> Excellent. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, I yeah, but again, like we didn't start hanging out um uh, until yeah, the probably like the late late summer early uh fall of that time because you yeah. know, um I I we can't have like not mentioned him on the podcast before, but Mitchell Schomburg, a close friend of mine, he mm-hmm. um you know, I've known him since uh Portland, you know, we were in bands um, since I was in, a, I was a freshman in high school and he was a sophomore. Um, wow, we, so yeah, cool. it's pretty wild. Like, and yeah. then he, he ended up coming to Berkeley after, I think I was, you know, I was already a junior. Um, and it was just so fun, like having a guy who, you know, I have such like nice memories of and with like having him come to school and like, uh, you know, be there and, and actually run in a lot of the same crowds as I was running in. It was just so, it was just like such a, like weirdly serendipitous like time yeah and i can't imagine like if someone from my high school that i was came to berkeley it would have been it would be so cool especially if you were that tight with them and yeah no it was such a fun group um yeah anyway (laughs) yeah absolutely yeah and it was just and like so much of what it was was just i feel like us just kind of you know sitting and just like all subconsciously kind of i feel like being in a pretty similar like wavelength and all kind of you know being people who like valued a lot of the same stuff obviously you know yeah. i mean it's it's hard to be a per i mean you know i i don't think many of our listeners are the opposite on the political spectrum as as we would be but yes. just being people who are from like relatively <laughs> similar you know backgrounds even though we're from different you know nations but it was just yeah. it's just such an interesting time um, no it we, definitely was yeah and we just were all like you know really experiencing the same stuff yeah i com- i completely agree it felt very very comfortable i feel like whereas a lot of the groups i think we spoke about this at the time but like a lot of the groups that i'd started berkeley and or like it takes a while until you feel <laughs> at least i found it took a while until i was comfortable f- with a group of people you know what i mean yeah absolutely yeah it's yeah that's that's the thing that you know we've i've talked about on here before is it yeah it's it's so it can be so you you find your group in you know such a limited amount of people and it, it took it literally took me until you know i was in my last semester to like find that good um you know that crew that that you were a part of that mitchell was a part of that um jules was a part of who i think we'll probably t- talk a little bit about because he he actually plays with you played with you in your yeah in your band um but yeah, yeah. um so uh moving on a tiny bit so i know that you are currently still um studying the mp e at berkeley which is music production and engineering yes. um yeah so would you talk to me just a little bit about um you know with your like background in songwriting and background in singing and you know playing guitar what more so drove you to 
um, you know, pursuing engineering and pursuing production and like what your experience has been like in the department. And this can be like pre pandemic, post pandemic. Like I'm a little curious about the post pandemic, but we can talk about that a little later. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, first of all, I mean, I think the reason I wanted to get into MP and E first, like when it first came into my head was because I was doing the songwriting major, which I love songwriting. It's my favorite thing. It always will be. But I think I was craving, like, I didn't feel like I had all the pieces I needed do you know what I mean? to mm. really, like, feel in control of the music I wanted to make. Um, yeah. And I'd done, I'd done in England, like, the, the A-level, the music tech A-level, which when I went into um, MP&E was kind of like, I already knew a little bit of the, or a bunch of the basics or, like, recording techniques, like, at the very basic level. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. um but doing it, doing it has been great. It's definitely been slightly out of my comfort zone. Because, mm. um, <laughs> I mean, I'm in the major, but I'm probably not the most technological. I would, you wouldn't come to me if you had a tech problem. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, and if you did come to me, I'd be like, go somewhere else. <laughs> um, but um, particularly for production, because I feel like that is my, um, like my next favorite thing, if we're going to, after yeah. songwriting. Um, it's been, it's been amazing. And um, I definitely feel like I have learned a lot being in the major or being surrounded by the people in that major mm-hmm. as well. Because I think, like, the first music that I put out or I really got a band together with, I didn't really have... Like, I had the songs, but I really had no like idea what I wanted to do with them. Or, like, yeah. I had no... Um, like, now you can kind of, like, I hear things and I'm like, oh, that would be... You know what I mean? I have kind of, like, a, a map, if that makes sense. I don't know. Yeah. But... Then I had no idea, and that's this doing this major has definitely helped me with that because you're just kind of like listening with a different set of ears, I guess. Um, yeah. and then the engineering side of things, yeah, um, I've learned a lot and it's been awesome. And I really, I'm gonna say I'm not a natural, but I really mm-hmm. enjoy learning about it. <laughs> like, yeah. I think it's really cool, and I really admire people who just are, you know, can handle it under pressure and just go with it. Um, but I really, I think I was really getting into the engineering part of the major, like the first class where it really required you to do some like stressful thinking was the semester where we went into um, lockdown. Mm. And so I really haven't done any of that for a year because you can't, you know, they didn't offer any of the engineering classes because how can you learn? You can't learn without doing it. No. So I'm taking my my last um, like engineering class this semester in a few Mm. weeks and, um, you know, I haven't done anything <laughs> for a year and I'm going on to the Neve and I have no idea. I really have no idea. Just being completely honest here. Really have no idea what to, yeah. I'm going in with that, to be honest, because it's been a long mm. time. But I um, I don't know. I'm excited. I'm glad I'm be able to do it because I didn't know that I was going to be able to um, until quite recently. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but I, I love the major. I'm so glad I did it. Um, I've learned tons, like, tons more than I would have if I hadn't in, like, Mm. in more than one area, like, even in songwriting, like, you just, you're, like, as a songwriter, when you're looking at things from, like, the producer or the engineer's side, it's, like, I feel like I've unlocked a, (laughs) something that I may have not ever, you know, thought about. Oh, yeah. I'm not trying to make any total sense, but, yeah. Yeah, no, totally. It, It, again, it's, like, it's more, it's, it's another set of, like, vocabulary that you, that you can use, like, even if, you're not the most knowledgeable. Like I still don't like, there's so much stuff that like, I might know the like theory of, and I might know like on paper what it should be, but it, like it really, it, it comes down to like the methodology. And that's something that like, it it's, it's kind of, I feel like it's, it's a great field for that because it's something that you like, like, you know, obviously with, with the pandemic aside, you know, if, if you were in the studio and I think that, you know, there are more people that are, starting to go back into studios but like you know it it just work it just improves with the time that you spend in the environment you know which yeah so so again yeah. uh, to reiterate so you so you guys are going back like are you going back to Berkeley like to Boston and being able to work yeah well okay so I have one I'm taking I'm doing part-time and I think I'm taking five classes mm. and one of them is in person oh. um so it's and I, I really think there are very few that are going back in in person I think there's you know a couple of the engineering classes have to Mm -hmm. go back to even exist um and then 
ensembles I think are going back, or at least some of them. Okay. Um, but I think there's very. It's not a lot. It's 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 mainly online. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. But studio time, I think, is a thing again. Good. Um, and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm ex- I'm excited for that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that I was so curious about that. Like, I know that um, I did an internship this fall that where we were helping to launch a podcast and. Uh, there are a bunch of people mm-hmm. that were sort of doing like music production degrees and were like doing like audio, like journalism degrees or video journalism degrees. And so much of it, like mp and like the major that I did, EPD, like so mm-hmm. much of it, you do your most critical work in this in the facilities. And like, I'll, honestly, like not to sh- like shade Berkeley or anything, but that's so much of like what your tuition money goes towards. Is no, being absolutely. Able to be in those facilities. Oh, my God. It's like the most important thing. <laughs> about being there almost yeah. you know what i mean mm-hmm. so it's it's nice that that's slowly coming back yeah yeah i'm really happy yeah. that that i'm really happy that that's happening that's that's excellent um so let's uh i'd love to get more a little bit more like artistic you know maybe a bit less specific like technically so um mm. uh like who in your opinion like are some musical artists you know they could be musical artists they could be whatever you know i i feel like it's interesting i'm gonna go on an aside uh, i'm not the I'm not the best uh, interviewer yet, but you know, whatever. Um, uh, so I feel like it's so funny, like inspiration for like music can come from so many different things. It can come from visual languages. It can come from like reading a book. It can come from whatever, but are there any specific, they could be musical artists. They could be authors. They could be, um, you know, filmmakers. Are there any specific artists, you know, that have shaped the way that you create and or like listen to music and these can be people who like are your collaborators like people who you work with a lot or they can be like people who you would love to work with you know that kind of thing yeah no um I mean the, I guess the, the people right now that really inspire me and that I love is um I love um Big Thief mm-hmm. and Adrian Lenka I think she is um like on a different realm for yeah. most people <laughs> mm-hmm. um because i don't know how she comes up with half the stuff she does um yeah. and i would marry phoebe bridges probably tomorrow <laughs> um so <laughs> that's yeah. like, she's so cool um mm-hmm. i love her and um but sort of like earlier on before i came like a few years ago before i came to the states i loved jeff buckley mm. um big time and um this guy called leif volabek and i Probably am um, screwing up that name, but he has, <laughs> <laughs> he is very talented and his stuff always makes me want to, like, it always makes me feel something. Mm. Um, as far as, um, I mean, you interviewed Jimena and I, mm. <laughs> every time I play with her, I just like, it's almost like I, I feel so much. It's just, yeah. um, she is so talented and she played on this, a couple of the songs that I put out this summer and, um they would be not as good without her. I don't think they'd be mm-hmm. halfway that. Like, she just adds, she's a very talented person. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's it's like I get shivers when I hear her sing, when I hear her play piano. Like, yeah, she's, she's yeah. top-notch, incredible. Yeah, no, absolutely. And to be fair, the same for um, Jules as well. Like, I, mm-hmm. he's been recording a lot of stuff for me recently, and he never really, <laughs> he never misses the mark, you know? No. He's always doing well. Yeah, it, uh, it, it was incredible. Like I, um, me and Mitchell, our buddy Mitchell Schomburg, um, we oh, worked yeah. on a tiny thing like a while ago. I don't think it, it, it hasn't been released yet. It might get released. I gotta, I gotta bully Mitchell into doing it. <gasps> um, but, uh, but Jules, uh, I think he said that he basically just like, cause they, they, uh, might still, or were at the time living together, um, they uh he basically just called him up to his room and was like hey man come sit down play some bass on this and he was like hey man like he talked to me and he was like hey dude i had uh jules come in and play some bass on it and like listening to the isolated vocal or vocal uh isolated bass like tracks i was just like oh uh oh that's good that's way too good (laughs) yeah that's that's, and that is the exact response i think he gets every time yeah (laughs) for everyone so no yeah i can't follow him at all right (laughs) Yeah. Totally. Oh my god. Um but yeah, yeah, so uh and just out of curiosity, um so who were some of the other people that played? We'll talk about um some of your songs a little bit later, but um who else? I think I 
your guitarist whose name I feel awful about forgetting, but I've had classes with him in the past. <laughs> Sam, Sam Best. Sam Best, yeah. yes. No, he is also, again, he's like so talented, um, so creative, and he's recently started um, like writing orchestral and like strings, Ooh. parts and like that. He's just started and he's been doing a bunch for me and he's so good. <laughs> He's so good. Like, yeah. I'm just, I feel like I'm using him a bit now because every time I write something, I'm like, can you hit some strings? Yeah. <laughs> and then, but he's so good because he, he, he does it in like a day. Like, I think he's just so creative and he just loves doing it so much that he just, he just does it. And yeah, he's, he's really, really cool. Yeah, absolutely. As well. yeah. yeah. And then, um, and then. If I'm not wrong, another uh, sort of mutual friend of ours, um, I had had a couple classes with him before, but um, I believe didn't didn't Alexi have something to do with your EP? Yes, yes, no. The first like the first stuff I released was um, I did all of it with Alexi. Yeah, yeah, Alexi Godard, yeah. I believe. Yeah. yeah, and that was that was that was super <laughs> super fun, mm -hmm. um, and it was also you know that was the first time I was really like. Um, well, the, I mean, the first time, I mean, I met him, but the first time I was really, like, working with him was, um, like, I asked him if he would record some songs for me. And like I said before, like, I really had no idea. Mm -hmm. I think I was like, can I record this next week? And he was like, wait, we finish in two weeks. And, you know, <laughs> booking studios at Berkeley is impossible. Right, <laughs> but yeah. some, somehow that managed to happen. And then the next semester, I um, did some more, like, a couple more songs with him. And, and um, yeah, that was... He was awesome to work with as well. Very good person to be in, a, in the studio with because it can be stressful, especially when you're doing it for a project and you have two hours to do something. Yeah. Um, and I, I get like that. Also, that whole process was quite good for my, I, I guess, starting out, like really backing myself, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, so, yeah, that was awesome. And he he mixed one of the tracks for the like the recent he did. How about that? Mm. over the summer as well and um yeah working with him's always it's always a pleasure so yeah absolutely yeah, yeah so it's so, so stacked in the in the collaborators you have it's always always so good like seeing so many cool people that just are like such like song people you know like well i think i've actually seen uh sam a couple times like play a couple times and he just like adds just the littlest like subtleties to whatever like the song needs you know he's kind of like i would um i would consider him and jules and jamina and you know alexi with his engineering um they're mm. very similar to i feel like the way that ringo Starr plays drums where he like goes for the song isn't the busiest player just adds like kind of the perfect thing that is like the finishing touch onto it yeah i know you're so right they're all such tasteful players and people and <laughs> I have <laughs> you know I I was thinking about this earlier today when I was thinking about like doing this and mm -hmm. um like being at Berkeley I feel like the things some of the things like the most valuable things I've learned have really been from the people around me rather than like the classes themselves yeah because they're just you know they're true artists so mm -hmm. absolutely yeah, yeah incredible um, so moving on just a tiny bit. Um, so something that I have seen that I've really enjoyed um, that was, I think, even happening prior to the pandemic with you was that you began sort of posting um, what you described in one of your Instagram posts as like song doodles. So essentially they're um, they're sort of musical sketches of like whatever you've been working on at the time. Um, and I really love that idea, like um, like putting out something that even though it might possibly be unfinished or like a work in progress, it's, it's like giving people a glimpse into what you're working on. And I, I love that. And so sort of a question off of that is like, do you think that it's important to like share those kinds of ideas, even if they're unfinished? Like, do you, do you still feel like it's, it's worth putting out? Yeah. I mean, I, I quite enjoy doing that. I think because I will start writing a lot of things and you know, I might, most of them I don't finish. So mm. most of the things that I've posted are just, that is what they end up being. I, mm. I decide not to continue them or whatever. Right. But I like doing that one because, you know, for whatever reason, I might decide that this isn't something that I love enough to try and finish. Mm. But, or on the other side, it might be that, especially if I'm not feeling so inspired, I post them because I'm proud of it. And then I, 
you know, different things get different amounts of feedback. And sometimes, like, I rely on my friends a lot to tell me what they th- they think of certain things I do. Yeah. And so I like doing it for that. I also like what you're saying. Like, I think it is good to put stuff out. And especially, especially in this, like, period of time where, like, you know, you're not gigging or you're not really even seeing anyone. Yeah. It's, you know, I've seen a lot of people fly into a different realm of, like, popularity over the last six months. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do think it's important. Um, I also think it's good for me to feel like I'm being productive. And part of that is, like, you kind of have to show people that you're being productive to keep yeah. them interested, you know? Definitely. With my like that, three that... fans I have right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's something that I, I totally feel like. Like, I always have consistently struggled with that. Like, I I was the kind of person where in school I, I tended to, like, hunker down more with sort of the like academia of like learning how to, you know, work the tools, learning how to do that and maybe not putting in as much time to taking on like external projects and having stuff that I could, you know, be able to share with a lot of people. And, you know, I, I do regret that a bit, but, um, you know, now it's, it's coming to the point where I'm, you know, I have to sort of put, put like emphasis on the fact that, oh, you know, regardless of if it's like, you know, at the standard you want it to be at, it's still worth putting out. It's still worth like having a lineage of, of content that you can track. And if anything, it shows your like advancement, like getting better at your craft, you know? Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I feel like, I mean, obviously the more you do it, the easier it is. And two, Mm -hmm. like you said, it's easier to see like your progression one, um, two, I think it gives you confidence because it's like, I never would have, when I left high school, have ever posted anything like on Instagram yeah. of me playing something because that would have been the least cool thing for me to do, you know. <laughs> um, and then, you know, like when I did start, you realize people, there are some people that do like what you do, you know what I mean? And then you yeah. realize it's important for your for yourself as well to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I to- Yeah, I totally feel that. It's, yeah, it, it, it's a... Uh... You know, I was talking to, to our, um, my friend, my Thornton, a little bit ago, and, you know, we were just mm-hmm. saying that it's it's something that, you know, it's such a double-edged sword. It can be something that can really be beneficial and can, like, help put you there, or it can be really toxic. But, like, mm-hmm. kind of regardless, you you people of our generation, we kind of have to use it as a tool, like, regardless. Yeah. And, and you can, like, try as best you can, like I do, to remove that sort of emotional attachment. But, like... I feel like in like no matter what happens, I'm always going to be get a little bit of gratification from seeing that people enjoy what I do, you know? Absolutely. And it's, you know, it's like like I sometimes I have to delete it because it's, you know, it's not always it's not always great for mental health or whatever. But sometimes like you need (laughs) you need to see people enjoying what you're doing. And if they're not, then, you know, (laughs) absolutely, and you move on. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, follow me on Instagram, everybody. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know. Um, so real quick, we're uh, on the podcast. We're going to take a short break. You're going to analyze some of your music more specifically. Um, but first, I'm going to throw to a meditation minute, which is probably going to be much needed in this wild <laughs> oh, time yeah. we're living in. <laughs> Howdy, and welcome to the eighth edition now of Meditation Minute. It's cool to be able to say that I have, you know, that many hours of content out there. That's something I love. Um, Yeah, so uh, this week's Meditation Minute uh, is another old recording just because, you know, I I like reminiscing, you know, with all the wild stuff that's happening right now. It's nice to look back on, you know, moments of serenity, if you will. Um, So this one was recorded um, in a field... I'm forgetting the exact like name of the city it was in. It's in rural, rural Washington. It's on the side of the, um, the Olympic peninsula, um, right actually on the way to, um, a really beautiful area called Lake Cushman, which is South, um, sort of right as the Olympic mountains start to jut up, um, on the way I stopped at a, uh, pretty much what was I, what's I think used as like a Christmas tree farm, Um, and yeah, it was just really calm and, um, there's little road noise, which, you know, if anybody here is a, at all into field recording, you know, that it's very difficult to get somewhere where 
traffic noise isn't a concern. Um, but yeah, I was really lucky with this one. Something that I think is nice for, you know, the the predicament that we're all in right now as, as Americans and as, you know, democracy is kind of falling apart in front of our eyes. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to get a recording that didn't have like very much of that kind of activity and, you know, even little subtle things that come through in a lot of field recordings. So I feel really good about this. You know, it's a, it's, it was a fairly windy day, so you might be able to hear a little bit of that, but mostly it, you just, you know, can listen to the wind and, you know, try to take some serenity in that. And also not forgetting the fact that, you know, getting political here, but you know, uh, we got to keep, we got to keep people responsible. We have to, you know, be sure that that the consequences take place for people's horrible actions. So let this, you know, recharge you and give you the, you know, resolve and the effort and the energy to keep fighting the good fight. Enjoy. We're back. Um, so before we get into like your music specifically, um, something I've been asking my guests recently, and uh, I love this question, and it's always something that I'm curious about. Um, where do you find yourself like most inspired? Do you do you, do you feel like it's like a physical place or like a state of mind or like a combination of both? Like how do you how do you feel about that? Um, I feel like for me, it's probably more a state of mind. Mm. Um, but I think also being in different places helps yeah. like, you know, being stuck in the same room for months on end is not helpful. Um, yeah. and it's not inspiring and I think whatever, but I, I think generally state of mind is what helps me most. Um, mm. which is tricky though, because it like, if you think about that, well, I guess it goes for either because, you know, songwriting teachers might say you don't need either. You just need to be good. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like you just need to read a book title and then write about it. But um yeah, I think it's it helps to have things going on in your life which is <laughs> or just at least seeing people. So it's difficult to be inspired at the moment for me. Yeah. Oh god, yeah. I can't I can't even imagine like finding finding the ability I would no, in no way like I I've said this before on the podcast, I would in no way consider myself like a composer or a songwriter or anything, but even just to like pick up a guitar, it, it's just a weird time like you, to sit behind a drum kit to you know play a keyboard whatever. Like it, it's a weird time. It, it I feel like it's like a widespread writer's block. I feel like is a, it would be a big problem right now. Absolutely. I mean, it, when when quarantine first started, it was kind of like, "Oh, I have so much time to do this." Mm -hmm. So I think I was like almost like spitting out like I, you know, like songs or whatever. And I did do a lot when we first started, but now like nothing has changed in my life for almost a year. Right. <laughs> and I'm getting little like tired. Like I have nothing to write about anymore, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah, definitely. But, and you know, it's, it's something that, um, that it's, it's great. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy for you because you know, you, you're going to have the ability to go back and at least be like, you know, somewhat resuming your classes and everything. Like I'm, I'm sure that that'll, you know, hopefully that'll trigger some more, you know, inspiration. So it'll happen eventually. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's it's yeah. like it'll circle around <laughs> like regardless, like it'll it'll come back. You know, it's it's tough because, you know, we literally, you know, we're coming up on a year of of uh, lockdown and it, it's it's been wild. But, you know, it's uh, it's it push. And I hate to like be like, oh, it pushes, you know, for some people to do things I wouldn't have considered. But you know, there's I and I really don't like to like look at it like there's benefits to this because it's a terrible <laughs> time. But you know, it it'll no, you know yeah. it'll it'll circle back and we'll we'll adjust to whatever you know the the definition of normal is at that point. So yeah, 
No, absolutely. I definitely see your point there. Yeah, definitely. Mm. So, um, but uh, so I want to talk specifically about your music now. So something that I feel is like really remarkable about you as a singer and as a writer is like the amount of just precision and control that you have over your voice. Like I, again, like we had talked about the, the concert that you, that I remember seeing you play with Jamina at, and I was like taken aback by the amount of like dynamic range that you had. And just the, again, like the control and the precision you had in your voice. I had, I had, you know, I struggled to have like, you know, remember anybody that I was so struck by when I first heard you sing, like, honestly, Thank you. That, that thank you. That really means a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I think to be honest, part of that comes down to because I think if I had had training, like I had had classical training mm. um, up until I came to Berkeley, and I think that probably did have an effect on the way my voice is because um, I wasn't. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure because I think it was the kind of thing where it's like people point out things in your voice and I think this happens to a lot of singers and you don't necessarily notice it yourself kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that definitely happened for me. And because then I came to Berkeley and there was, there's a lot of things that I do that people point out to me, like voice teachers or, you know, professors and would be like, not correct. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but um, like, I think if I, I'd had, this sounds a bit, I don't, I'm trying to explain this in a way because it's like I didn't none of these things I can um I didn't intend I don't I don't know I feel like I'm talking about things like that aren't No now. no I totally but, I think I get what you're what you're like leaning towards Yeah like I had a teacher once he I was auditioning for an ensemble and he said how do you do that and I, I said I don't know <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about <laughs> I've just had no training that's all <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And then he like for the whole time I was in that ensemble he kept saying things to me like that's not like some people will hate you <laughs> oh my god <laughs> and I was like brutal I'm gonna take that as a compliment it means I'm special that's what it means <laughs> so. that's such like a backhanded compliment oh my god yeah I mean he definitely meant it in that as that he was I mean I liked him as a teacher but he mm. was he he challenged me so yeah totally but, yeah no I I distinctly remember um not to like, I'll, we'll we'll get back to it in a minute, but like, yeah, I I had to teach. I I think it was in a ratings audition that I had. Um, mm -hmm. That I went in and they were literally like, uh, get your left hand like technique a little bit better. And I was like, okay, yeah, and that's fair. Like they'll be, they were like, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's not how you do it. Like turn your stick around, because I I think I had because all through like my teenage years and stuff, like playing drums, I you know played in punk bands and shit and i would have like i would play with like the butt end of the stick like facing out so just like okay. to hit really hard and they were like oh that's not how you do it and i was like oh oh yeah okay yeah sure yeah no, no i basically lived my whole life just ignoring that yeah <laughs> people saying that so right. it's not right and i probably will live to suffer the whatever but you know <laughs> right i guess yeah no that, that's that's really funny but you know it's it's again it's uh, they you know i for me at least they they told me they told me a lot of beneficial stuff and um no ab absolutely <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah totally um but so, yeah so speaking of like of vocal control and you know stuff like that so obviously we had talked about um Phoebe Bridgers we talked about Adrian Lenker we talked and but I feel like in your voice like some some people that like were drawn to mind in like my head were even people like Joni Mitchell and people like Joanna Newsom or people like um you know Victoria Legrand of Beach House like it's it, you have mm. that you have a really similar amount of sort of like individualism and peculiarity in your voice and like have you known like have you known that that's true like have you have you listened to yourself in comparison to other people in your similar style and been like hey i i sound yeah. i sound different you know <laughs> thanks i mean yeah uh i mean I didn't until people told me, mm -hmm. I think. And I think it's even when I listen to myself now, like it's you listen to your voice, like when it's your voice. Yeah. Too much. So I, I, I can see, I think I can see what people are saying now, but it, I didn't for a long time. Right. Because I didn't know what they were talking about. And I wasn't really trying to do anything other than just sit, you know what I mean? Like get the notes right. Yeah. Um, so, um, I'm very grateful that that's a thing that I get frequently because, you know, it, I, it's nice. Um, 
Yeah. But and jo- and Joni Mitchell particularly, like I didn't listen to Joni Mitchell until like, like a few years ago, and I definitely got that before then as well. Mm. And then when I did listen to her, I was like, oh my god, this is the biggest compliment I've ever got in my life. <laughs> totally. <laughs> like wow. Like I, yeah, she's so so cool. Yeah. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. It's and you know it's something that that I'm I'm just excited for you like to listen to how your style like evolves over the years and like like vocally and like you know musically however whatever directions you take i i think that your voice has like is so adaptable to different like genres and stuff so i'm i'm just excited to hear like what you have next like what you have Thanks. cook and what you have in the book so <laughs> thank you yeah um so uh some songs i want to talk about uh, they're both from coded blue which was the ep that you released in i believe july of this year yes yeah yeah Totally. Um, so both of them are incredible songs. So I'd love to start with um, How About That, the one that we had talked about earlier with um, that Alexi helped uh, helped out with. Um, so talk to me a tiny bit about like the writing process of this song and maybe in turn, like sort of the the writing process of the whole EP in general. Like, did you find that each of the songs sort of came at the same time, like in a similar way mm. or were each of them just like completely different? Yeah, I mean, I think, ha- uh, so how about that and Rusty, I wrote in a similar time period, probably mm-hmm. within the, like the same couple months. Yeah. Um, and um, the third song that's on that, Lonely Stranger, I'd written maybe six months before. Mm. So I think with that IP, it just, it turned out being, it was more of a collection of songs that I'd finished that I actually felt like I wanted to put out rather than like this is a project that I've tried. Like here's the first, like it wasn't a continual thing, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, how, how about that? Um, was like that song. It's weird because it's like, people will ask me what that's about. And it's, I don't really have an answer because I think Mm. I kind of put three different situations into one song Mm. and they all kind of made sense. But really in my brain, I'm the only one that really understands. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> if that makes sense but I think you know it's in a way where it's like you can take your own interpretation and run with it but mm-hmm. um that yeah that one I'm trying to think about this I think that one took me a, fin- a, a while to finish to be honest because of that reason because I didn't have like one set idea or one set you know vision for it I right. was just kind of like going with how I was feeling at the time and I was feeling a lot of things at that time I think <laughs> yeah no and that's honestly that was something that I actually have like in my notes like I feel like the way that and I'm glad that you said that because like the way like there are a bunch of different ways I feel like that you interpret the phrase. How about that? Like mm. and it, it comes in so many different meanings, like with your lyrics, you know, it's I feel like the there's one that I sort of keyed into a bit more. Um, and it was sort of like a bit more like a, a self-reflective one that, you know, um, like you're sort of looking at yourself like, you know, how about that? Like how it happened. And, you know, one of the, I'll, I'll read a, I'll read a couple lines from it, but like, um, something that's in there is, uh, like maybe I don't know where I'm going and like, that's okay. And then, uh, another line is sometimes I think the only things that I'm sure of are the hardest things to prove. So that I feel like, like those, you know, now that you told me the, you know, that this song isn't just about one thing is, is so interesting. Like it really does tell, like I was, honestly like kind of like trying to connect it and be like okay you know this touches on a lot of different stuff but I'm glad that (laughs) I'm glad that that uh you know that is more clear to me now yeah and I'm glad that it kind of comes across that way as Mm -hmm. well you know yeah um because it definitely was just kind of spitting on a page kind of situation yeah and it and it's (laughs) like it it, it, again it's like exploring those like different definitions of how about that you know and I think that's so cool no, that's awesome. I'm I'm really glad that that's what you took from it because it definitely was. It was definitely like self reflection and then kind of sarcastic, like how about that? You know, right? I mean? Exactly. And then, me, and then me being pissed off, like how about that? <laughs> yeah, that was, <laughs> was those were literally like those. the three different ones that I had written down. I was like, so it seems like self reflective. It seems a bit sarcastic, and it seems like <laughs> yeah, I was, that's perfect. That's okay, so, I think that's so great. Yeah, I think we're on the same <laughs> page with that. That's great. That's awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah, so um, talk to me, like, a bit about, like, how you had envisioned, like, the production on this one. Um, was that something that um, that I, you know, we talked about Alexi, and, you know, he lent his hands to this. Um, but I'm I'm imagining that there's, like, you, you probably had, like, an ideal version of the song in your head. Like, what, how was that reflected? Mm-hmm. And, like, how, how did the, the, like, end product, how did it change from what you had expected? What, you know, what was, what was similar? Like, how do you feel about that? 
Mm, I mean, for, for this song, this was at the time I had like a weekly, it was actually for a class, but I had mm. like a weekly ensemble thing with Jimena, Jules, Sam, and my drummer Matt as well, who's awesome, oh, cool. that we didn't mention earlier. Yeah. But like we, the production for that came from basically like those sessions. And we'd, like one of the other songs we did that way was Rusty as well. But mm. um, so the first time like I started thinking about production was basically like in that setting and with those people and um, it was one of those songs where it was like, I'm trying to think about it now, like actually how it started, but I don't think it took very long, that song in particular, for people to be like, have a feeling with it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like some of those songs we would go into, I would, I would know I would go into and be like, hmm, not everyone is feeling this so much. It's not coming so easy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Whereas this was one of a couple of the songs where it was like, oh, this is kind of working um kind of has that like acoustic intro and i think at that time i was like that's that was when i was really just after i'd started getting into like early phoebe bridges stuff like mm. the more like acoustic vibe and i was like that's what we're going for here yeah um some stranger and then, in the alp shit oh oh that is exactly <laughs> exactly it yeah um and um and then we went into like lockdown we were like okay so we can't do the ensemble anymore <laughs> yeah what are we gonna do and then we're like oh let's just track it and i think from there, like, one of the good things that have come out of lockdown, to be fair, is looking at production, it's very different because you kind of have to force yourself to put things down to yeah. then reflect on it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's been really cool. Um, and that's basically how we did it. Like, and we would go through it as a group, which was also really nice um, because, you know, it's always easier to work on things when you're doing things with people. So I feel like yeah. we're all kind of responsible for the production of that because... Especially in that song, like, Jimena did, like, a kind of, like, a voice, like, synth vocoder situation. Yeah, I love that. In, yeah, and, like, I wouldn't, I would never have thought to do that, to mm. be honest. And then she put it in there, and I was like, this is going to stay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is great. Yeah. Um, and that's basically how we did it from there. And, um, yeah, I, the th it, it was kind of a prolonged process, I feel like, the production for that one, because we thought about it a bunch, and then it was kind of that thing where it just happened over the over the quarantine we were just putting things down and i was like i like it yeah <laughs> that's basically what happened yeah yeah that's that's excellent yeah so um so the next one i wanted to talk about was rusty which you were saying probably came in in like a similar way um so mm. yeah I, I just love the fact that yeah it you know it, it again it like brings me back to to playing in ensembles um the guest that i'm actually having on next week um uh, eden forfang i played in her band for you know, a year and we oh, came man. about it with the sim like in a similar way, you know, we would all sit yeah. down and it would, it would not take us very long to, you know, get that feeling of like what we wanted. So yeah, it's, it's such like an, a powerful thing and something that, you know, I, I look forward to, and I'm sure you look forward to as, as we start to, you know, inch out of this weird, weird time. So yeah, definitely. That's yeah, <laughs> definitely. So, um, yeah, so Rusty particularly, um, you know, something that with this song, you know, there was a line that I think I had seen a, a video of you playing this live before the EP got released. And there's one line in it that stuck with me. And it was the every cell in my body vibrates for you, which is such <laughs> a cool line. And and something that carries through a lot of your music is like the really vivid imagery that you allude to. Like in my head, they translate like so well and like so clearly to like a visual language like you would see in a movie or in a music video or something. So, like, do you feel like, do these kinds of images, like, pop into your head when you start writing these mm. as well? Or, like, do they come to you after? Or do they, are they even there? You know, I'm, I'm sort of curious about that. Yeah, I mean, for, for this song, I, I, I really was trying to make a visual, um, like, emphasis on it in the, in the lyric writing. Yeah. Particularly, like, I really did, was trying to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and what does it I mean yeah I think I do the things come into my head but it's not necessarily like it's it's kind of like they're there and I'm like how do I put this into words now that yeah. sound good um kind of so it doesn't always it's different for every song I would say but for this one like definitely and it felt like it was really necessary I think um just for I guess like at the t that time or whatever I was yeah. trying to do do with it um but yeah I think I'm really like this is probably the song that I'm most I feel most connected to and like mm -hmm. I'm most proud of because I think partly because of the visual element of it but also because it feels like like one of I don't know it feels very like that is exactly what I was feeling then you know what yeah. I mean like I was not fucking around no. <laughs> like 
it was and it feel, it feels honest and i and that's why that's what i'm you know that's what you want to do all the time but it doesn't sometimes it works better than others and, yeah, yeah exactly like like if you can you know like uh sort of expressing that like emotion in its purest form like if you can do that then you're like really writing good stuff and i feel like you you did that so well you you it was so like well executed in this track so i just commend you commend you deeply on that thank you very much <laughs> yeah so um moving on a bit um so we're we'll get a tiny bit personal not like super super personal but you know um we'll just get a bit more personal so um yeah. in your musical career what do you feel like um have been some like hurdles that you feel like you'd have to jump over some you know uh struggles that you've found yourself like having to deal with mm. Hmm, this is a great question. Um, I think, uh, I mean, the first one that's coming to mind, I think, is like coming to a school where everyone does music. Yeah. <laughs> and like, to be honest, though, it, when I, I mean, when I first got to Berkeley, I was like, oh, my gosh, mm -hmm. um, these people are on a different level. Like, it's instrumental, like uh, by instrumentalists, I was just stunned by. I was like, these people who like... <laughs> basically could be the next Mozart in my mind yeah. at that time you know Absolutely. what I mean I was like who are you <laughs> um I think I first got there and, and I was kind of like stunted for a minute because I was like why am I here <laughs> um, exactly and then I think it was good though because it kind of I got to this place in my head where I was like well I might as well just do what I like anyway because mm -hmm. no one's gonna give a shit either way because yeah. like everyone's doing their own thing anyway um so I think that was definitely a hurdle <laughs> like huddle I had for a while yeah um and then otherwise it's just like the stress of writing music to be honest because mm -hmm. every time you like right now I I mean the stress and also the love of it you know what I mean it's amazing yeah. but it's like it's almost like when you can't it's like excuse this analogy but it's almost like you're constipated you know what I mean mm -hmm. it's so annoying it's so <laughs> annoying like yeah. Like I'm struggling with this right now because everything, every time I pick up a guitar or I try and do anything, I'm like, absolutely, this is shit. Like, yeah. <laughs> what am I doing? Mm -hmm. um, but that, I guess that's a lifelong struggle, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and then, oh, I mean, I guess when I was trying to get in, like when I was trying to get into music schools, that was quite stressful because I had no idea what else I was going to do in my life. Yeah. I was like, if I fail, well, waitressing it is. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, totally. Yeah, you you know, you just you just it 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 shows like how you know, regardless like I, I was talking about this last week with with my pal Yael. We were we were saying that like regardless of like what you like are doing at the moment, like, you know, there that that passion is always going to be there and it's something that like ebbs and flows and it's something that you're not always going to have like the best day with. It's not it, you know, it it and that's just something that you know, it's it's a relationship, I feel like, that you have to, you know, nurture. Yeah. And, you know, it's, you know, it's not always going to be sunshine and rainbows. It's not, you know, it's there. It, it's going to have its down points, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like um, being an artist or be a, being a creative or whatever. It's just like having faith in yourself is is probably the biggest struggle. struggle. I probably should have said that because mm -hmm. that's the thing. You're fighting with yourself most of the time, I feel like, until, you know you are like whatever your goal is you achieve yeah. it yeah yeah absolutely yeah the again like i i certainly am my own worst critic um i'm sure it's the same with you like yeah yeah we're mean to ourselves for sure yeah exactly <laughs> it, it's that it's that self-love you know again it that like that lends itself so much to like what we were saying about you know the the creativity being a relationship with with you know the outcome and everything is it you know it 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 comes and it goes and but it, it's it's always there it's just like how to tap into it you know yeah no absolutely yeah, definitely Oof. so um yeah so we touched on it a tiny bit um but like you know sort of with that uh but like what does your artistic life look like right now in the pandemic like are you like we you know we had said that there's definitely a fair amount of writer's block and everything but like how what is like your day-to-day -day mm you know, being a, a musician during a global pandemic, like what does that look like for you? <laughs> it, um, for the most part has been, um, I mean, up until recently, like we've been speaking about just writing a lot, mm -hmm. um, which has been, which has been really, really, really nice. Yeah. And having the time to do that mm -hmm. or even like attempt is really, really nice. But also, I mean, I think it's forced me to like, 
I mean, obviously no one's playing shows. I mean, I've done a couple of virtual shows, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's nice to have the opportunity to do, to do those. Yeah. Um, but, um, otherwise it's just like, I think it's been good for like me thinking about production, to be honest, because, you know, mm-hmm. I had nothing else to really do. Right. Like, other than when I write a song and I'm like, okay. And it's also made me like sort of try these things out myself, which I probably would not have before. Cause it's different when you go into a room with people Oh yeah. Like I'm, I'm not a person that's very good at describing what I, I'm thinking maybe, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If if it's coming down to a song, like I might think something, but I will have, I I will struggle to say it. So it's been good for me to do that because then I can try it myself. And then I'm like, Oh, I don't hate this. I could do this myself. (laughs) You know, you know what I mean? And so it's been good for that. And I've definitely, I've spent a lot of time working on songs that way. Um, which has been, which has been great. <laughs> uh, sometimes I think like, what would I do if I didn't have this as a hobby? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would be, like watching, like, I don't know what I'd be doing. Um, so mm. it's been really nice and it's honestly, it's, yeah. Uh, I feel like I've learned a lot in that sense as well. So that's probably the basis of what my life as a musician is like. At the yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's, it's tumultuous. It's, you know, it's glamour, it's rock and roll. It's whatever, <laughs> you know, it's, it's really yeah. funny. Yeah. Like it's, they, I, I feel like there's going to be a lot of badly done documentaries about or not documentaries, but like dramatization, like movies of like what it's like living during a pandemic. And I'm really yeah. fucking excited for that. Honestly, like I'm ready for <laughs> like some dog shit movies to come out about like, oh, it's all about getting together. You know, even though the sentiments there, like I'm really, really I love movies that are like really badly executed i love them oh. so much and like I'm it's just good ready humor for that. isn't it yeah no i hadn't thought about that that's great yeah the exactly. movies about 2020 the passion projects that happen when most of the time it's nothing <laughs> yeah exactly like i heard yeah. for example like you know kind of going off a little bit um but i heard that like michael bay made some movie about like if the pandemic gets way worse and like it's like some like oh. futuristic thriller i'm like jesus christ okay we gotta wait a couple. We gotta wait until we're fucking out of it until you guys can do that, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone's ready for that right no. now. I'm too emotionally fragile to think about that. <laughs> exactly. Oh my god. Yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> um. Yeah. But uh. So yeah, we're we're pretty much at the end of the podcast. Um. But one last thing, I kind of you know want to ask you. Um. You know, and and I think it's important because I I we're both I'm a I'm a bit older than you, but you know we're not that far off in age. Um, And I think that, you know, Mm -hmm. regardless, sort of why I wanted to start this podcast is because I feel like young people have, you know, experiences and knowledge that needs to be shared and, you know, legitimate, you know, concerns and stuff about about the state of the industry and everything. So what would you like, what would your uh, advice be for, you know, younger people, you know, slightly younger than us, you know, way younger than us? What would your advice be for you know, looking to get into playing an instrument, to get into production, to get into songwriting, whatever, you know, what would, what would you suggest they do? Like, what would your, you know, what would your advice be? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think that honestly, it's just like, if you want, if you want to learn an instrument, like I remember when I first started learning and I'm not like the most incredible guitar player there is, but like at the beginning, it feels like hell because you're like, oh, this is so much harder. Like I recently bought a violin and I was like, it's like this naivety of like, I can play. And it's so yeah. difficult learning an instrument. It's so difficult. And I, you know, you forget until you, you do it again and you're mm-hmm. like, oh God. Um, but you just have to do it every day because it is fun if you really love doing it. And it's like, yeah. when I look back, like I'm, I'm so happy that I did that. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I get so much joy out of it. Um, so I think with all of these things, it's just like the thing I've learned, I think that's progressed like my whatever it is in terms of music is just doing it again and again and again. Yeah. Um, or like, cause it's like, like the first songs, when I first started writing songs, they were awful, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? You don't, who cares? Like, it's going to be the same for everyone. People who, okay. Well, maybe there are some people who they write their first song. is amazing, but yeah. <laughs> for most people that does not happen. No. And like, if you really love doing it, it doesn't matter anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would also say like, don't try and be anyone else because you will write boring music. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, that's that's yeah. great advice. Yeah, I'd, yeah, I you know in the in the the social media age, it's funny because I'm t- I'm gonna talk shit about social media, but then I'm gonna plug myself on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, me too. But it's okay. uh, you know, in the social media age, you know, you, there's so much, you know, inspiration that that is so you know readily out there. There's really concrete things that people can work off of. But like you know, it's it's about like 
going into yourself and it's about like finding you know what's gonna you know push you to do what you need you know that's that's something that you know it it, it can be triggered by other things but i feel like deep down it's like you know you, you have to really take that into heart and it has to be something that yeah. you mull over like within yourself completely agree it's like it's complete personal expression it's like yeah therapy <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. well i want to thank georgia so much for being on the podcast so good to see you my friend um you too i'm so humbled to be this was a fun conversation and it's so great to be here absolutely so. <laughs> um after after our uh you know uh decrediting of social media where can our audience <laughs> find you on it <laughs> You can find me everywhere. <laughs> you can find me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure uh, on Instagram, my handle is Georgia A. Parker. Mm -hmm. And then, like, if, you're, if you want to listen to my music, it's just Georgia Parker everywhere. Yeah. Um, and, and then, like, an EP title is Coated Blue. Yeah. Just to be more specific about it. Mm -hmm. But um, pretty, that's, that, that would be it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, everybody go listen to Coated Blue. And your EP, your 2019 EP, Too Far Gone, is also great. Yes, go listen Thank to you. both of those. Yeah, I yes. will. Um, I'll have them linked in the in the description of this episode. Um, but yeah, awesome. yeah, it's so it's such a good, such a pleasure seeing you. Love, love, uh, love talking. You know, hope to yeah, see you soon. Too. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Um. So this has been early reflections. I'm Adam Daniel Jones. Here come the social media plugs. <laughs> Find us on Facebook at Early Reflections with Adam Daniel Jones. I'm on Instagram at Adam Daniel Jones, all lowercase. And the podcast is on Instagram at Early Reflections Pod. And uh, remember, early reflections have an important role in determining the sound and character of a space. See you soon.